talking about ketones in the brain, can we can we talk a little bit more about that? So the, the brain famously can use glucose, but can also use ketones. Uh, and is kind of is are ketones a preferred source of fuel? Oh, the, the brain famously can use both. Mm -hmm. um, and this is thought to be the evolutionary basis for why we have a ketogenic system at all. Um, the brain can't use fatty acids for energy directly. Um, it can only use ketone bodies, but it can use either glucose or ketone bodies. So if there's not a lot of glucose around, if we're fasting, um, it can switch to using ketone bodies instead of needing more glucose. Because the, the brain is kind of the one thing in our bodies that, uh, you know, that we can't shut down. <laughs> so if you're starving, you got to feed your brain one way or the other. The rest of the body will sacrifice itself to keep your brain fed. And specifically, you will use muscle to make glucose to keep your brain fed. Um, but the fact our brains can use ketone bodies um, helps to offset that. So instead of having to use all our muscle very quickly to make glucose, instead, we can tap those fat stores. And we have a lot of energy stored in our fat. And our brain can, can live a long time on on that energy in the form of ketone bodies. It always needs a little bit of glucose, but if you starve for you know a few days, it can actually switch to mostly using ketone bodies for energy. Um, now the the brain is is kind of agnostic, you know. So different different cells, different tissues have different preferences for glucose or ketone bodies. You'd think that this is stuff that we would have learned a hundred years ago, but this is actually kind of cutting edge stuff, um, and we're really picking it apart cell type by cell type. Um, heart cells, it turns out, love ketone bodies, heart muscle cells. They will they will pluck ketone bodies out of the bloodstream uh, and use them uh, instead of using glucose. Um, the brain is more agnostic. It'll use whatever is there. If there's ketone bodies there, it'll use ketone bodies. Um, it'll use glucose too. It'll use them both. Um, muscle is kind of the, the other end of the spectrum. Uh, muscle, you really have to kind of push ketone bodies into muscle. Uh, skeletal muscle uh, for muscle to use lots of ketone bodies, uh, but the brain will use both. Um, where this gets interesting in a in a potentially therapeutic point of view is where the brain can't use glucose efficiently anymore, and this is a common feature in aging and in diseases of aging that affect the brain. Um, so most famously in in Alzheimer's disease, you know we. Uh, we can visualize the effect of Alzheimer's disease on the brain by looking at glucose uptake. And we see glucose uptake, you know, dropping in areas of the brain that are affected by Alzheimer's disease. We know there's a profound relationship uh, between the ability of the brain to generate energy from glucose and the cognitive impairment that comes with Alzheimer's disease. This video is brought to you by Bioptimizers. Magnesium is a crucial mineral for hundreds of reactions in the body and impacts everything, including sleep and muscle and bone health. It is difficult to get sufficient magnesium through our food. In our efforts to remain fit and healthy, my wife and I frequently exercise, after which it's important to recover well and get restful sleep. To help us with this, we chose Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizer because it blends all seven essential forms of magnesium into one effective supplement, while also using all natural ingredients and being gluten, soy, and lactose free. It has improved our recovery and sleep quality since we've been taking it. And we are happy to tell you that Bioptimizers are offering a 10% discount for Magnesium Breakthrough to Modern Health Span audience. Just go to www.magnesiumbreakthrough.com modern or click on the link in the description to get a 10% discount with coupon code MODERN10. Thank you for your support. So that's that's been one of the motivations for studying ketone bodies. As far as we know, the same changes don't happen with ketone bodies. The, the brain can continue to use them even as its ability to use glucose drops. So maybe if we, you know, uh, expose the brain to more ketone bodies, feed it ketone bodies, maybe that'll help offset the, uh, the energy deficits in Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's a really interesting hypothesis. Um, it's being tested now in, in what are still small clinical trials of ketogenic diets and exogenous ketones. Um, you know, and, and we don't have a great answer yet. It's still too early. 
Um, but it's a really interesting idea. The same thing may happen in delirium, the geriatric syndrome that my lab studies. Um, delirium is an acute confusional state that happens, especially to people when they're really sick in the hospital. It's not dementia. It's not Alzheimer's disease. It gets better. It can reverse, but it's almost like a temporary version of that. Um, you know, if you're, if you have bad COVID in the intensive care unit and you're on a ventilator, odds are you're going to get really confused. This is delirium. Part of the pathophysiology of delirium, similar to Alzheimer's disease, is energy metabolism drops, glucose metabolism drops in certain areas of the brain. Um, the difference is that when the delirium resolves, the brain gets better. Um, Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately, doesn't get better. Um, but I'm interested in ketone bodies and delirium for the same reason. Uh, you know, maybe this is a way that we could help to feed the brain in a different way. Um, I think it's going to turn out to be more complicated than that. Um, but this is this is part of the whole idea of um, of how our our body's use of energy changes as we age, changes in certain diseases, and could ketone bodies be a part of either how our own bodies help to compensate for that, or how we could design new therapeutics? Yeah, that would. That would be interesting, whether we should all go around drinking MCT. Um, so keto, So very briefly, you talked about ketones as signaling mo molecules. And I would like to talk a little bit about that. I mean, is is it essentially a like a fasting mimetic or, or is it more complicated than that? It's covering other areas. It may be part of that. Um, you know, again, fasting, ketogenic diet, these are very physiologically complicated things. Uh, but you can start to break them down into pathways and mechanisms. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier, this so far seems like it's been very fruitful in generating targets and drugs to lead into clinical trials, for which the whole idea is to kind of leverage and amplify certain parts of fasting and dietary restriction uh, and use it to target aging broadly in the clinic. Rapamycin. TOR inhibitors generally are a great example of that. So is metformin. Um, so that's that's where may, that's where ketone bodies may fit in. You know, it, it's not fasting in a pill. It's not none of these are fasting in a pill. None of these are dietary restriction in a pill. Ketone bodies, exogenous ketones, are not a ketogenic diet in a pill. But it's part of it. It's part of the biology that these more complicated things create in us. Um, and if it turns out that that's the relevant part of the biology for a particular purpose, like helping the brain function better as we age or helping the failing heart to pump more efficiently um, or helping to prevent diseases of aging like uh, like diabetes um, and osteoporosis and Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, then that's, that's the therapeutic promise that we could capture specific bits of these things and turn them into translatable therapies that could be very widely used. That's the hope of geroscience. Mm -hmm.